Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. Uh, we've been doing these SALT Talks in lieu of our in-person conferences in order to replicate the experience that you get at those conferences. You know, we really try to provide a window into the minds of subject matter experts and also provide a platform for big, important, world-changing ideas. Uh, today, we're very excited to welcome Sam Zell uh, to SALT Talks. Sam is a global industry agnostic entrepreneur and investor. Uh, he has a long track record of turning around troubled companies and assets, leading industry consolidations, and bringing companies to the public markets. His current investments are focused in energy, logistics, manufacturing, communications, healthcare, and real estate. Sam is the chairman of Equity Group Investments, the private investment firm he founded more than 45 years ago. He also chairs four companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, those are Equity Residential, a leading apartment REIT, uh, Equity Lifestyle Properties, a manufactured home community and resort REIT, Equity Commonwealth, an office REIT, and Covanta Holding Corporation, an international owner and operator of energy from waste and power generation facilities. He just recently sold Annexter International Incorporated, a company he chaired for 35 years for four and a half billion dollars. Sam is best known uh, for his role in founding the modern real estate industry. He founded and chaired Equity Office Properties Trust, the largest office REIT uh, until 2007, which he sold for 39 billion in the largest leverage buyout at the time. In addition, he introduced the first Brazilian and Mexican real estate companies respectively to the New York Stock Exchange through Equity International, a second private investment firm he founded to focus on real estate related businesses in emerging markets. Sam is an active philanthropist with a focus on entrepreneurial education and sponsors three leading programs at the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business, Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Business and, and Management, and the Interdisciplinary Center Herzilia IDC in Israel. The Zell Global Entrepreneur Network, <coughs> ZGEN, unites the students and alumni of these programs and actively provides them with connections, opportunities, mentorship, and support. Sam also sponsors the Sam Zell Robert Lurie Real Estate Center at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton Real Estate Center. He holds a JD degree and a BA from the University of Michigan. So you can, it's fair to say he's a Michigan man. Uh, Sam represents the REIT industry on the New York Stock Exchange Wall of Innovators. He was recognized in 2017 by Forbes as one of the 100 greatest living business minds. In 2017, Sam debuted his book, Am I Being Too Subtle, which was published by Penguin Random House, in which he shares fundamentals and philosophies that made him a self-made billionaire. Uh, interviewing Sam today is going to be Anthony Scaramucci. It's not the first time Anthony and Sam have had a conversation uh, with SALT. Sam has been to several of our SALT conferences, so we thank him for, thank him for joining us for this digital version. Uh, Anthony is the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, which is a global alternative investment firm, as well as the chairman of SALT. And just a reminder, if you have any questions today for Sam, uh, type them in the Q&A box in the chat uh, window at the bottom of your video screen. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anthony. Oh, great. Uh, John, thank you, Sam. Thanks so much for being on with us uh, today. I just want to uh, point out the, uh, there was no sarcasm in the title of the book, Am I Being Too Subtle? Sam could never be subtle enough, as everyone knows about Sam Zell. Uh, but if you have not read that book, I encourage you to read that book. I have sent that book out, Sam, to hundreds of people. I made my uh, oldest son, who I think you met, we had breakfast with him one morning, just graduated from Stanford Business School. I, I, he, he loved the book, gave it out to about another hundred of his uh, fellow students. So uh, please read that book. Am I being too subtle? And since you are never subtle, Sam, that is uh, the absolute truth, let's get right into it. How do you view the economy, the economic landscape in the shadow of the pandemic? Where are we going? What do we need to be worried about, sir? Well, first of all, Anthony, if I knew the answer to that, I'd be rich. Uh, <laughs> richer, all, richer. All I can have is an opinion. Um, I think that uh, most people have uh, overcome the idea that we're going to have a V kind of recovery. Uh, and I think uh, that's probably a valid assumption. Uh, I think that uh, the way things look today, uh, I think they're better than they looked 
three months ago, uh, but not any reason for uh, object uh, you know, opportun optimism. Um, I, I think probably um, something like a U-shaped recovery. Uh, I think we'll see uh, some significant recovery between now and the end of the year. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, unemployment at the end of the year were 10% or lower. Uh, now, normally you'd say 10% is uh, recession. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, I, I, I do think, however, that um, once we get past this pandemic, uh, I think our, our, our ability to recover um, will, will be significant. Um, I think it's important in, in line with that thinking, uh, at least from my perspective, um, when I look at the pandemic um, and, and everybody is talking about a vaccine, which I'm hopeful we'll have a vaccine, but I, it's hard for me to imagine that we can have a vaccine anytime in the next you know, year and a half or two years, or, or at the, that would, in my opinion, probably be the shortest time uh, where that could be you know, determined. But I don't think we need a vaccine in order for our country and the world to go back to business. I think we need to eliminate the concept of death as one of the results of this virus. Uh, both, you mentioned, um, you know, um, before when we were talking about Mike Milken and I talked to Michael uh, recently and, and he's been working uh, on, a, on, a, on a drug that was used in uh, prostate cancer, which uh, suppresses testosterone, which seems to suppress uh, the connection to the lung of this pandemic. Maybe that's a solution. Maybe the guys in Oxford will come up with something. Maybe there'll be a cocktail. But once we quote unquote get death out of the equation uh, and it becomes a flu, maybe a more stringent flu than what we've been expected, uh, I think you'll see our country uh, quickly begin uh, to recover. You think, you think the capital markets, Sam, are priced right for that recovery? Or are they ahead of themselves? Uh, what parts of the capital markets may be behind where things are? When you look at the landscape of the credit and equity capital markets, what's your opinion there? Well, my view before the pandemic was that the capital markets were very expensive. My view uh, when it took its dive uh, was that, th that we were having a correction. Uh, when it recovered as much as it did, I thought that the capital markets were getting overheated again. Um, at the moment, uh, in, in a general term, I think the capital markets are too uh, willing to assume what I call good news or too desperate for good news. And therefore, I think that the, cap the capital markets generally are probably too optimistic. Certainly, the debt markets uh, have been wide open and they've, uh, and we've, you know, Finance a staggering amount of uh, of stuff in the last uh, three or four months. Um, obviously, the Fed has has facilitated that, um, but I think it's still a little too optimistic on the equity side. We still have a bifurcation between uh, value and growth, um, and I I thought before the pandemic that that uh, bifurcation was too great, and nothing has changed in my opinion when when you look at the uh what some people are calling residual permanency so meaning we've had lost economic output and now there may be some permanency meaning that local restaurant on your local main street is now closed it can't reopen or that store is closed or jc penny you know, is in bankruptcy and we'll have to see what happens. But Pure One Imports went into bankruptcy and they've vacated their store. So when you see that residual permanency piece, 
Uh, does that make you worry, sir? Does that make it harder for us to recover? Or do you think that the economy is so adaptive that those resources and labor and all the different things that went into those businesses will recirculate into other places quickly? Well, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I hardly could be surprised at what has actually happened. I mean, if I interviewed uh, a bunch of people last December and asked them about, you know, what their view of J.C. Penney was, uh, maybe they wouldn't have predicted a bankruptcy as quickly as there was one, but there weren't any optimists in the room for J.C. Penney. Probably similarly uh, to uh, Neiman Marcus. Uh, we're obviously, uh, we, we, have, we have been overly retailed up for many years. We've been in the process of adjusting to it. I think the pandemic acted as an accelerant uh, to the strategy, to the themes that are were already uh, in process. Even, even your example of the restaurants, uh, you look at the statistics, the number of restaurants created in the last four or five years uh, sets an all-time record for new openings. And, uh, and my own view was then as it is today that, that there just isn't enough demand to support that many facilities. And obviously the pandemic and the closing uh, subsequent has, has brought that to the forefront. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, retail establishments uh, that will not open. Uh, but I would also tell you that, you know, America is a great place and, uh, and it's full of people who have ideas and uh, uh, maybe they won't be willing to rent the stores at the same rates as previously, but they're gonna wanna rent the stores. They're wanna, gonna wanna try out their ideas and I don't think entrepreneurship is dead. So, I mean, that, that's a good transition to my next question related to the consumer. Uh, so you've got some of those vacancies and you and I agree, entrepreneurs will eventually fill those vacancies. In some ways, the economy will become even more dynamic, but the consumer seems to be impaired right now. If you look at the savings rate that was tallied a few weeks ago, Sam, it was at 33% historic high and people are concerned and people have you know, either lost jobs or have lost some pay. Uh, are you worried about that impairment to the economy in terms of uh, it causing a more meaningful, longer lasting contraction? Or do you think that will stop once we start, stop fearing the health scare? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, at the, at the early stages of the health scare, uh, people were using the term depression. Uh, I don't. I, I don't think that that was relevant then, and I don't think that's relevant today. Uh, are we going to have a recession? Um, I think we already have a recession going on. Uh, although I don't think it's going to be anywhere in de as deep as a lot of the savants have suggested. Uh, I think that the, just what you've seen in the last few weeks as there's been some partial opening uh, of various places around the country. The results have been, uh, people have been willing to spend and in fact seem to be, you know, uh, very excited about the opportunity to get back into the com commerce side of the world. Just a few more questions Sam, on the macro economy. So your analysis of the stimulus, both the fiscal stimulus and what's being uh, put into the capital markets by the Federal Reserve. What is your reaction to that? Is it a, is it a mama bear stimulus? Is it too much? Is it too little? What's your opinion? Well, I, I think the best way to answer your question, Anthony, is to compare it to the stimulus of 08. Uh, or the famous Nancy Pelosi uh, stimulus bill, uh, which I think, you know, was basically focused uh, on uh, adding to unemployment, adding to uh, existing programs without really focusing on what the objective was. This stimulus, I think uh, Mr. Mnuchin deserves the credit that it was focused, it was, it, was, it was basically bridge financing to get us over uh, 
uh, the 90 to 120 day period that we were anticipating, we were gonna see uh, the, the country closed or partially closed. And I think they succeeded in doing that. I think that uh, a lot of people are probably relatively surprised at how well we're doing today, considering what we've been through. Uh, obviously, uh, Mr. Powell deserves similar uh, accolades for very actively and aggressively uh, making sure that uh, the existing economy was not destroyed by the quote unquote shutdown. Okay, so I want to I want to ask you about investing. I want to switch gears a little bit. Uh, you seem to have backed the truck up in energy at a time where supply is up and demand is down. And so you are a great contrarian investor by nature. What are you seeing in that space that other people are not seeing? Well, first of all, uh, you know you got to ask me that question five years from now. <laughs> and, maybe, and maybe five years from now, we can both either, you know, cry or laugh together. Uh, it's way too early uh, to reach any conclusions. Uh, I've always been fascinated by uh, arenas uh, where capital becomes very scarce, despite the fact that there's nobody disputing the fact that uh, there's more capital floating around the world today than at any time anybody can remember. Uh, if you're in the oil patch today, uh, there ain't no capital floating around. And so I was intrigued and attracted uh, by uh, the fact that uh, the kinds of yields that were available and the kinds of situations that were available uh, are very, would have been very rare by historic standards. Uh, our, our involvement in energy uh, has been hardly back the truck up, but certainly uh, we've been more aggressive than most people. Uh, we had a hiccup when the price of oil, you know, uh, fell through the elevator shaft, but that was really a short-term scenario that was unlikely to be repeated going forward, and we've seen uh, pretty significant recovery since then and pretty much, you know, stable in that arena. Uh, natural gas today is up 11%. Uh, it seems like it had been, you know, beaten down well beyond any rational scenario. And so, you know, fossil fuels are not going away. Uh, the pricing of fossil fuels are not uh, going to be, uh, uh, prohibitive going forward. And uh, I think it's likely that the investments we've made uh, during this period uh, should produce uh, uh, significant returns. So it's, it's sort of a related contrarian place. I'm just interested in your reaction, given your real estate expertise. Uh, there's a lot of bears in the commercial mortgage-backed security space, very similar to energy. You know, the, to your point about capital, sort of leaving certain areas of the market. Are you a contrarian there as well and think that there's representative of good value there? Or, or do you think that the, uh, you know, the, the consensus is correct in commercial mortgage-backed real estate? Well, I think that referring to it as a commercial-backed real estate uh, is probably- an Well, CMBS, commercial mortgage-backed. No, no, I know, right. but in other words, but if you look at where the real focus of CMBS has been, it's been in retail. Uh, there's much more retail in CMBS than there is residential or anything else. Yep, or, so, or commercial office buildings for that matter. Or, yes, you know, right. like there's office, but it's primarily primarily retail, which, by the way, is you know as far as I'm concerned, is still very much of a of a falling knife. And, uh, and when you package things together, uh, as CMBS does, uh, you end up with, you know, you might have a good mall and, and four bad ones. And that just drags down the whole scenario and, and uh, sends capital fleeing. And that's basically what's happened. And I wouldn't be, you know, very confident that those people who have stepped up 
and taking advantage of the CMVS uh, market are likely to end up with uh, very high positive results. No, I, okay, makes sense. So, so let's switch over to office space then. What's your opinion of office space and uh, both the suburban markets and the, you know, sort of the 24-7 cities? Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the 24-7 cities. Uh, they've, they, people have talked about it as though as a passing, you know, phase. Uh, I totally disagree with that. Uh, I think the 24-7 cities will suffer somewhat, but they're not going away. Uh, people are not going to move to Keokuk, Iowa from New York City uh, just because they can remotely uh, connect to their job. We're social animals. We want to work together. Uh, you know, nobody's figured out a way to motivate by modem. Uh, we've done very well uh, by uh, you know, uh, operating office space and, and businesses remotely. But it's very important to remember that we've done so because we're operating with a bunch of people that we know, that we trust, and that we have expectations. Uh, if, uh, if it were five years from now and there'd been a 25% turnover in, in, in people working, uh, we would be sitting here trying to do a remote problem, not really knowing or trusting the people at the other end of the phone or the end of the Zoom. And so when it's all said and done, we may end up with a scenario of um, four days a week. Uh, uh, we may end up with a scenario of uh, lack of concern about you know working from home for a day. But when it's all said and done, if you wanna run a business and you wanna be successful, you need to create contact between the people. And that's what office space provides. Now, having said all of that, um, even before the virus, uh, I, was, I believed that we had a significant oversupply of office space in America. Um, we didn't see it because we had assets like we work, you know, taking up space like there was no tomorrow because they didn't intend, intend on paying tomorrow. But they took up a lot of space and, and, and in effect uh, created an environment where people didn't understand that we're building a lot of stuff, a lot of new buildings, uh, Hudson Yards, and you know, it's Hudson Yards is 14 million square feet. There's another 5 million adjacent to it. And Steve Roth has got a giant project uh, you know, above Penn Central Station. Uh, you know, that's a lot of space. Uh, we have a similar situation in Chicago where, you know, we've had four or five new office buildings. They've emptied out the old buildings and we don't have tenants for, the, for those old buildings. So I think the office space business um, is likely to suffer from oversupply, but, but an oversupply kind of similar to previous periods of oversupply uh, as opposed to uh, something dramatic like everybody working from home. Uh, let, let's switch gears a second. I'm going to let John answer a question and ask a question in a second, but I want to ask you about hospitality before we go to the uh, the outside questions, Sam. What, what are your thoughts there uh, and its potential recovery? Well, I mean, if, you know, I don't own any hotels, thank God. Uh, if I did, um, you know, I would be slitting my wrist, uh, wrists uh, because in effect, you know, it's very subtle. My... It's very subtle, Sam. It's a very yeah, subtle you know, description. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, to go from, uh, you know, 70% occupancy to zero uh, kind of gets your attention. And, uh, and, and I, you know, and, and the answer is, uh, you know, the hotels are going to slowly open. Uh, occupancy is slowly going to, you know, increase. But, but it belies, you know, one of the big issues that I have been focused on since the pandemic began and the shutdowns began, and that is everybody's talking about the costs of having your, your building closed down. Nobody's talking about the costs of reopening. And those are very significant. And even in the best hotels uh, across the United States, 
uh, they're going to open at 5% and then they're going to go to 10 and they're going to go to 12 and they're going to go to 15 when meanwhile losing their ass. So I think it's going to be a, a tough environment. I don't believe that this is going to end the quote unquote convention business or the, or the uh, uh, use of hotels to make deals. I think it'll start with, and I've heard a lot of people say, God, with the experience we're having right now, I don't know why we ever, ever put anybody on the road. Uh, well, and I, I would expect that as it starts, there will be reticence of people to go on the road and they'll say, we'll just zoom it out. And that's what will happen until some young aggressive guy gets on a plane, goes and gets the deal done while you're sitting on Zoom selling an idea. So I don't think we have any uh, significant change. Uh, we, you know, we had, again, just like office space, we had an oversupply in the hotel business already in place before the, before the pandemic. And the result is there's going to be a significant number of hotels that are not going to reopen. Uh, but they would have, I would bet that they would have not reopened except maybe a year or two later than what's going to happen now. So I think the hospitality business is not going anywhere. Uh, I think people like Marriott and Hyatt and, and, and Hilton, uh, you know, are, are going to get only more dominant and stronger. Uh, as the, the as the world reopens all right very, very terrific commentary as usual sam i'm going to turn it over to john for some outside questions and then i'll i'll feather some more back in thank you yeah, we, have, we have great participation on the call and a lot of audience engagement so so thank you everyone who's listening for that uh, the first question is about you know one of your reits eqc has been sitting on about four billion in cash uh, for several years in anticipation of a downturn which is what we're now seeing, what will you target in terms of sectors, geographies, and where in the capital stack are you going to be looking to take advantage of some of that distress? Well, first of all, uh, the answer is it's got about $3.4 in cash. Uh, we took it over five years ago, and we've sold 150 assets uh, during that period of time and assembled the $3.4 billion. I might add that uh, it's very unusual. We sold 150 assets and we don't have one regret uh, so far. Uh, we don't buy markets, we buy deals. And I think that the capital is gonna be used to uh, respond to specific situations. Uh, I can tell you it's unlikely that will get involved in retail. Aside from that, uh, I think we will be involved and we will start to expend that capital. Um, uh, and by the way, I don't expect anything to happen for another three or four months, uh, but I expect we will begin to spend the capital uh, as we deal with uh, other landlords and other owners of real estate who, uh, in one form or another, survive this far, maybe through pretend and extend, but uh, you know the game is ending, and uh, and and I think the the lending community, uh, whereas in 08 or 09, uh, was afraid to do anything and therefore did a pretend and extend, I think the lending community this time around uh, very much wants to quote clean the books. And I think there are going to be a lot of uh, foreclosures and opportunities. Thank you for that, Sam. You mentioned on CNBC a little while back that you were buying gold for the first time. What attracted you finally to gold? Are you still buying it? What's your outlook for gold and, and silver? Um, the only thing I bought is gold. Um, and I continue to buy gold. Um, not in uh, staggering proportions, but you know, making it a uh, a part of my you know diversification, uh, and it's very much a, a response to the debasing of currencies on a worldwide basis. 
Uh, you know, it's not just the United States that's had QE2 and 3 and 4, but it's everywhere in the world. And uh, so far, um, you know, we haven't had any inflation because everybody is doing it at the same time. Uh, but there's little doubt in my mind that uh, this is not going to be like that uh, forever. And uh, I think that a prudent investor uh, would have, you know, some proportion of his assets in, uh, in the, you know, metal uh, gold. Outside of real estate and gold, as you just mentioned, are there any other industries or specific types of deals that, that you're looking at that you think present tremendous opportunity in this distress cycle? Well, we have, uh, we've spent a lot of, uh, of our time uh, in the distribution uh, end of the world. Um, and, uh, and it's been a very, and, and they've done very well through uh, the pandemic, which is really interesting. And consequently, uh, I, and distribution is another way of talking about it as asset light. And I think that, you know, we're intrigued and interested in, in uh, business opportunities that are asset light, uh, as opposed to other times uh, when our whole orientation has been just the opposite. Fantastic. So uh, there's a question relating to, you mentioned the troublesome environment for office buildings in general, and, and there's some questions about how those office buildings can potentially be repurposed. So could old office buildings needing major improvements in, in large cities uh, with large homeless populations, and, and we, could we eliminate laws that mandate or, or eliminate uh, single room occupancy uh, from allowable use? Uh, should those laws be revived and maybe including provisions for jobs and other social assistance programs for those office spaces? Well, um, you know, <laughs> uh, it's hard for me to imagine uh, that you're going to turn an office building on Third Avenue into an SRO in the same manner as it's hard to imagine that you're going to turn an office building uh, on the sell street into an SRO. Uh, I also think that you're, you know, talking about it rather glibly, but the economic cost of trying to do what you're talking about doing is pretty staggering. Uh, so, although it sounds good, and, uh, you know, and I'm all for kumbaya, uh, the answer is that. Uh, I doubt, I mean, yes, there will be some office buildings somewhere that are created and, and, and used to solve the homeless problem, but you ain't gonna say I solve the homeless problem without building housing and, uh, or converting some assets to housing. But converting an old office building to housing is a staggeringly expensive scenario. I've been to the movie and I know. so. Uh, I just think that uh, when it's all said and done, you know, what they've been trying to do in California for the last three or four years, which is uh, increased density, and particularly, you know, in transit corridors, uh, that's what's got to be done across the country in order to generate uh, the kind of housing we need to solve uh, what is a significant problem. Uh, obviously, it's been, uh, it's been held back in California and everywhere else in the country by you know the NIMBY uh, scenario or not in my backyard. I think that uh, you know as, as a population and as a country, uh, we're gonna have to come to grips with the fact that uh, we can't allow uh, uh, NIMBY to you know determine the future of our country and, and, and have the kind of impact that it's had today. We have several questions about your process as an investor and how it applies in this scenario. So I'm going to merge them into one. You made a lot of money after the savings and loan crisis. You know, you, you basically predicted the 2008 crisis. You sold, you know, had a record sale of, of your business prior to the, the 2008 crisis. What is the indicator in your mind that tells you when to take risk off and what's the indicators or in, indicator or indicators uh, that tell you it's time to put capital to work 
And then how do you compare the opportunity set in this current crisis as it relates to the savings and loan crisis and the 2008 crisis? Well, I think that uh, it starts with the fact that today, um, we just don't know where we are. Uh, you know, the number of transactions that have occurred uh, are minuscule. Price discovery is minuscule. Uh, in the past, it's been very easy. I mean, in the, in the, in the, in the post uh, savings and loan crisis arena, uh, making investments uh, was, was, in my opinion, as simple as it's ever been. Uh, and it basically revolved around replacement cost. Uh, I was buying office buildings <coughs> all across the United States in 91 and 90 and 92 and 93 and buying apartments and, uh, and all those assets uh, were, were basically sold to me at significantly less than it costs to replace them. Uh, that meant that long term uh, I was protected from competition by virtue of the price at which I had bought. At this moment, uh, we have a tremendous disparity between the bid and the ask. Uh, I think that the, the current owners of real estate basically think, well, uh, or, or take the position that nothing has really changed. There's been a, a three or a six month uh, uh, gap uh, while, while everybody sits back. And, and as soon as it's over, we're going to go back to 3% yields and uh, on, on office buildings and apartment buildings, et cetera. Uh, at the other end of the coin um, are, you know, buyers who are sitting there saying, wait a minute, you know, we've had a major, major event that has occurred uh, that has changed everything forever. And it, it's got to change cap rates. It's got to change uh, risk. Uh, it's got to change everything. And therefore, uh, you know, what I was willing to pay uh, six months ago, uh, I'm not even willing to pay, uh, you know, a, a take a cap rate, uh, you know, double. And maybe it should be even more than that. Uh, this kind of disparity, frankly, is not unusual. Uh, and that's why we have something called price discovery. And price discovery, in effect, comes about as a result of multiple transactions. We are a long way from having any multiple transactions. And that's why I think we won't really know till the third and fourth quarter of this year uh, what the impact on real estate is gonna be. Thank you for that. In terms of you know, looking geographically a little bit, you, you talked about how you don't buy markets, you buy individual deals. But as you look around the world, you know, the economic pain has, there's been some dispersions between the economic pain in various countries. What's your view generally on international markets, specifically emerging markets? There have been times when emerging markets have been uh, very attractive. Uh, and uh, at the moment, I believe that there's no reason to leave the United States. And that when it's all said and done, as an investor, there is nothing more secure than the rule of law. And uh, so I think the United States represents the strongest and the best market in the world to take advantage of the post-pandemic uh, period. Within the United States, are you focused on any particular types of markets? The question is relating to whether you think uh, states with no state income taxes and more business-friendly environments are set to continue to grow a lot more quickly than, say, you know, places like New York, San Francisco, with high tax uh, frameworks? Again, I think you got to be really careful uh, not to make too broad a series of assumptions. Before the pandemic, uh, you know, the, mo the most, two most expensive markets in the country were New York and San Francisco, both of which did not seem to suffer very much from being very expensive. Um, in the same manner, you know, Florida is everybody's favorite place to retire to. Uh, the problem is that retirees don't rent a lot of office space uh, and they don't create new businesses. So Florida may be a great place uh, to retire to, 
uh, I'm not sure it's ever proven to be uh, a great, you know, uh, uh, investment horizon other than if you're uh, providing housing uh, or if you're providing entertainment. So Sam and I want to know, John, what the monkey behind you is reading. Okay, now I don't know if Sam can actually see the monkey behind you, but oh, you know, we're we're not we're not wasps, so we're looking at that thing, saying, "What <laughs> is that exactly?" So, what is the monkey reading, Darcy? Maybe I'll save it for the uh, the ultra premium uh, salt talks that we have, but it's maybe maybe I'll share it on the next call. Um, sort of, I, it's sort of unbelievable, Mr. Zell, that he would actually put that in the in the room raider shop, but it's fine. Uh, Sam, you don't send out those musical boxes anymore, but one of your friends is texting me and they're asking, what would the song be this year if you were sending out those musical boxes? That, uh, I don't know. Um, probably something about the fact that it ain't over yet. <laughs> Yeah, see, I'm I'm a Sinatra fan, so I would say the best is yet to come. Right. Uh, well, well, you've been absolutely terrific as usual. We're very we're very blessed to have you as a friend. And uh, uh, you, you had asked me a question about the live saw conferences, and so yes, we're hoping to get that back up and running as soon as we think it's safe to do, and hopefully we can blend in these uh, these virtual conferences. Uh, Mr. Darcy, you have any any final remarks here before we let Sam go? No, what I'll say is yeah, thanks a lot to the audience for your engagement on this. I know we didn't get to every question. Sam, you're a popular guy and, and people want to know what you're thinking because of your prescience uh, around every other crisis uh, that we've seen in, in your lifetime. So, so thanks so much for joining us. Maybe we'll have to have you on again as a, a follow up to this conversation. And of course, we look forward to having you at our next live salt conference, as Anthony said. My pleasure. Thank you. And be all safe. Right. All, the, all the best. And, Thank uh, you. Thanks, Sam. Again, thanks for joining today's call with Sam Zell, and we'll see you later in the week.